This video talks about carbon dioxide transport. And carbon dioxide transport occurs in three different ways. There is the bicarb, which carries about 90% of all the carbon dioxide. Then there's a dissolved carbon dioxide in the plasma. And then there is the one bound to globin. It doesn't really bind to the heme, it binds to the globin. Okay? That's a third way of carrying car um, carbon dioxide. Now, when carbon dioxide is bound to hemoglobin, we call it carbaminohemoglobin. Carbaminohemoglobin. Okay? Now, do you remember what it what it's called when carbon monoxide binds to um, our hemoglobin? It's called carboxyhemoglobin. So don't confuse the two, carbaminohemoglobin and carboxyhemoglobin. Carbaminohemoglobin is bound to carbon dioxide. Carboxyhemoglobin is bound to carbon monoxide. How beautiful, right? Okay, so now let's talk about, this is my, this is my effort to draw an RBC with a central kind of pitting. Anyways, so let's start with carbon dioxide in the plasma. So we have carbon dioxide in the plasma, or let's in the peripheral tissues. It enters the carbon dioxide, it enters the RBC, it binds with water by using the enzyme carbonic anhydrase, and it forms H2CO3, or carbonic acid. Carbonic acid dissociates to form hydrogen and bicarb, okay? And there is also a channel here. So what happens is, every time a bicarb is made, the bicarb can leak out of the channel. So we can, we can lose bicarb like that from the RBC. Now see, it has a negative charge. And if we keep on giving bicarb into our plasma, don't you think our plasma is going to become a little bit negative in charge? So what happens is, in exchange of this bicarb, we're taking in a chloride. This process of exchanging chloride for a bicarb to, main, to maintain electrical neutrality, okay? Electrical neutrality, you get it? To keep the electrical uh, system neutral. This is called the chloride shift, right? So when we're releasing bicarb into the blood, we're taking in chloride into the RBC, and we have something called the chloride shift. Now, I also talked about two forms of uh, hemoglobin. One was the uh, taut form, one was the taut form and the other was the relaxed form. And we talked about how that binding of carbon dioxide favors the taut form and the binding of oxygen favors the relaxed form. So when there is too much carbon dioxide in the system, you know, the equation is going to move to the right and uh, we are going to have formation of taut form or we are going to have more taut form. But if there is more oxygen bound to the hemoglobin, the, the equation is going to move to the left, and we're going to have more relaxed form of hemoglobin, right? Another thing is, okay, so that's the taut form and the relaxed form. Now, another point of view is, um, okay, there is two terms that I want to talk about. Those are the Haldane effect and the Bohr effect, okay? Haldane effect and Bohr effect. So when our this RBC reaches our lungs, what happens? There is oxygen, more oxygen, and more oxygen binds. When more oxygen binds to this hemoglobin, the, uh, it, the, the relaxed form happens, right? There is more relaxed form of the RBC, and the equation is going to shift to the left. As a result, carbon dioxide is going to be formed from the from the from the bicarb or carbonic acid, and carbon dioxide is going to be released into the plasma. This effect, in going in this direction, is called the Haldane effect. The opposite happens in the tissues. When there is oh, way too much carbon dioxide in the tissues, carbon dioxide enters, and, e e and the equation moves to the right, um, and we have more bicarb formation. This uh, form, the top form, and this kind of going in that direction is called the Bohr effect. So now let's add one more layer to the story, okay? So when our RBC is in the lungs, there's lots of oxygen, and whenever oxygen binding happens, and whenever the hemoglobin is in the relaxed form, it is going to um, 
it is going to encourage or it is going to stimulate the production of hydrogen and hemoglobin from this form. So this equation is going to move to the right. The hydrogen bound to hemoglobin is going to dissociate. And this hydrogen obviously binds to this, mm, to, to the carbonic acid forming carbon dioxide. So they're all interconnected, right? When there is more oxygen, more hydrogen ion is formed. More hydrogen ion binds to more bicarb forming more carbonic acid, forming more carbon dioxide and water and carbon dioxide is released into the peripheral tissue. And the opposite happens in the tissues, right? So oxygenation actually dissociates proton from, the, from this state, hemoglobin hydrogen bound form. It, it is going to form hydrogen ion. So oxygenation is going to shift this equation to the right direction. Okay, so now I'm going to pose two questions to you. Number one, why bicarb is not made in the plasma and it is made in the RBC? The answer is, in the plasma there is no carbonic anhydrase. And without any carbonic anhydrase, we cannot make any bicarb. So that's why bicarb is not made in the plasma. Question number two, what kind of situation inside the RBC makes it more prone to make more and more bicarb? That would be deoxygenated hemoglobin. Deoxygenated hemoglobin is going to make more and more bicarb, right? Because when oxygen, uh, hemoglobin is uh, deoxygenated, carbon dioxide can, you know, move this equation to the right. So I know I'm being very repetitive, but these things can confuse us a little bit, right? So anyways, let's go ahead and do some questions. So question time. Question says, it has been determined in healthy volunteers that the chloride content of erythrocytes is much lower in the arterial blood than in the venous blood. The action of which of the following is most likely responsible for the observed difference? Answer is spectrin, sodium, potassium, ATPase, carbonic anhydrase, 2,3-BPG mutase, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So obviously the answer is carbonic anhydrase. So now let's see why. The question says, it has been determined that in healthy, healthy volunteers, the chloride content of erythrocytes, the chloride contain content of erythrocytes is much lower in the arterial blood. So they're talking about the chloride content of our erythrocytes. So they're saying that the chloride content of our erythrocytes is lower in the artery than in the veins. So why is it lower in the artery? Because in the artery, there is more oxygen. And so the equation, the curve, really shifts to the left, right? So there is, more, there is less uh, hydrogen carbonate or bicarb, and there is more oxygen bound. So if, there is, if the curve shifts to the left, then there is less chloride coming into the RBC. That's why the content is going to be much lower inside the RBC of an artery than in the vein, where in the vein there's lots and lots of carbon dioxide which is going to shift the curve to the right, as a result making more H2CO3, which is going to draw in more of the chloride. So the chloride content inside the RBC is going to be much higher in the veins than in the artery. Read the question very carefully. Um, is determined healthy in volunteers that the chloride content of erythrocytes is, is much lower in the arterial blood. Co chloride content of erythrocytes is much lower in the arterial blood than in the venous blood. So that's, that's the answer is going to be carbonic anhydrase.